Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 13a. This is the fifth tutorial in a series focused on accounting for capital or financing leases. This particular tutorial will focus on accounting from the leasee perspective. In a lease a situation where there is a BPO or bargain purchase option, which implies a title transfer. There are four learning objectives for this tutorial. The first will be how to review how to calculate the lease payments from the perspective of the leaseor. We will assess all the relevant financing and capital lease classification criteria, this time only from the leasee's perspective under both IFRS and ASPE. Uh, we will then prepare the necessary journal entries to account for financing capital leases, again, from the leasee perspective, uh, where there is a bargain purchase option, also known as a BPO. And when a BPO exists, that basically assumes that there is a transfer of ownership at the end of the lease. And we'll do this in situations where the implicit interest rate is both unknown and known by the leasee. And finally, from the leasee perspective, we will prepare a partial balance sheet illustrating how financing and capital leases should be reported by the lessee. This tutorial continues to use a version of the Pebbles and Bam Bam uh, example, this time version D. So make sure that you have downloaded and reviewed the version D file for Pebbles and Bam Bam before proceeding. And the first requirement, as we have done before, will be to calculate the lease payment as determined by the leasor. Okay, so let's get to it. The lease payment. Uh, by now, you should be comfortable with following along with how we calculate the lease payment. It's been the same every time, again, always from the lease or perspective with the calculator in begin mode. We have a lease term of seven years, so 7N. The interest rate that is implicit by the lease or is 10%, so 10IY. The present value of the equipment being leased today is 500,000, so you put that in as a 500,000 plus minus PV. And then we're going to use a future value, an FV of 20,000. Now, um, the reason why we're using 20,000, even though in the data it says that there is a expected residual of 50,000, what happens is this 20,000 basically is the BPO. This is the bargain purchase option. So what happens is that it supersedes any stated residual value because the 20,000 becomes expected cash flow. And basically, the reason why that is is because it's assumed that the leasee will happily pay $20,000 at the end of the lease for an asset with an expected value of 50,000. And because of 20,000 is the actual cash flow, that's the number that is used in place of the residual. If there was no bargain purchase option, then you would calculate the lease payment with the 50,000. So when all is said and done, if we compute the payment, we should end up with 91,450. So we'll now move on to the second requirement, and that is basically for scenarios A and B, uh, where in scenario A, the leasehold rate is unknown, and in scenario B, the leasehold rate is known. We're going to evaluate all the relevant leasee criteria to classify this lease to Pebbles, assuming the company follows either ASPE or IFRS. Okay, let's proceed with assessing the criteria. So in the blue area here, we have the situation where the lease source rate is unknown to the leasee and the green or the uh, lease source rate is known. So let's start with ASPE first. The first criteria is to determine whether or not there's an explicit transfer of title at the end of the lease. There's no indication in the data that this is the case and therefore in both scenarios, the criteria is not met. The second criteria is whether or not there's a bargain purchase option. Well, in this situation, there is a bargain purchase option where the leasee has the opportunity to buy out the asset at the end of the lease for $20,000, which is less than their $50,000 residual value. So in both scenarios, that criteria is met. And that's enough right there to trigger a capital lease. The third criteria is the economic life, where we're looking to see if the lease term represents 75% or more of the economic life of the asset. In this case, a seven-year lease term divided by a nine-year life is 78% which is greater than 75%, so regardless of the scenario, this criteria is met. Fourth, we look at the economic value to determine if the value of the lease exceeds 90% of the fair value of the asset. In either case, the present value in a situation where the leaseor's rate is known or unknown exceeds or equals the fair value of the asset. In the case of the interest rate being unknown to the lessee, the present value is 476000 
484 divided by 500,000, that's 95%. In the situation where the lessee knows the lessor rate, the present value would then be 500,000, which is 100% of the fair value. So in both cases, the 90% threshold is met. For ASPI, we can conclude that this is a capital lease. The last two criteria present here relate to IFRS under the IFRS 16 contract basis evaluation approach, where basically all leases are now determined to be financing leases unless they're deemed to be short term or of low dollar value. And neither of these is present in this case. So our conclusion is that this is indeed a financing lease. Let's proceed to requirement three now, where under both scenarios, A and B, where the rates are unknown and known respectively, we're going to have to prepare the required journal entries for Pebble to account for the lease in 2021 and record the settlement of lease in 2028. What we have here is using a 12% interest rate in the situation where the leaseholder's rate is unknown, 7N, 91,450 payments to 20,000 future value, basically represents a guaranteed residual because the leasee will pay $20,000. The present value with a 12% interest rate, 476,044. In a situation where the leasee knows the leaseholder's rate, has to use 10% and the PV works out to 500,000. And here's what the amortization tables look like for them, starting at 476,484, ending at, well, pretty much close to zero because of rounding, 500,000, ending up at zero. All right, let's proceed with the journal entries. Uh, under both scenarios, the dates are gonna be exactly the same. Of course, the only difference will be with the numbers. So to record the finance lease from Bam Bam, the leasing will debit the asset under a finance lease or if it's ASPE capital lease and will credit the lease obligation and for its present value of 476,484 in the situation where the leaseholder's rate is known the leasee will capitalize the $500,000. The entry to record the payment due on inception is the same for both because the payment is the same so debit the lease obligation and credit cash. Next will be at the end of December 31st, 2021, where the interest expense needs to be recorded and the interest payable accrued. To accrue the interest expense, we'll take the present value, 476,484, minus the initial payment, because the initial payment all goes to principal, times 12%, which is the effective interest rate, and then times 8 over 12 months, because that's prorating from when the lease uh, was entered into. So uh, that's eight months including May. Then, uh, for the uh, in the situation where the leaser's rate is known, the same debits and credits, of course, but in this case, the calculation is just slightly different, where you have 500,000 minus the payment times 10%, times 8 over 12. So whereas under the first scenario, the interest expense will be 30,803. In the second scenario, where the leaser's rate is known, it's 27,237. And then finally, with the depreciation expense entry, so debits, depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation, we're going to depreciate over the useful life. This is very important because when you have a BPO, this assumes that the leasee will take ownership. So if the leasee takes ownership, it's presumed that they will keep it to the end of its useful life. And so therefore, uh, the depreciation is calculated as 476,484, which is the present value minus the 50,000 residual, not the bargain purchase option, but the $50,000 residual. And so that divided by nine years because that's in the economic life and prorated uh, times eight over 12 for that first year means that in scenario A, 31,591. In scenario B, the only difference here is instead of the present value being 476,484, it's 500,000. Again, minus the 50,000 residual divided by nine years times eight over 12 is $33,333. Okay, so now we'll jump ahead to settlement of the lease. Even though the lease settles on January 1st, 2028, what I want to illustrate here is uh, entry at December 31st, 2027 for that last interest accrual. I've also included down here a piece of the amortization schedule. What you see here is the final interest amount is going to be 2142 to clear this up. 
to accrue it at the end of December 2027. We're going to debit interest expense credit interest payable by 2142 times 8 over 12 months. So that has to be prorated. So that's 1,428. In scenario B, the balance in, in the, uh, the remaining interest is 1818. So 1818 times 8 over 12 is 1,212. Then finally, the last entry on May 25th will be as follows. We set up this interest payable that now has to be removed. If we're going to debit the interest payable here for 1,428. We're going to debit the interest expense for the remaining four twelfths of the last bit of interest. So that's 714. You see here, because of the rounding, there is a balance of 17,858. Uh, so that's the balance that I used to clear this entry out. We could actually use 18.454, where that clears it out. So the lease obligation is gone. The cash is credited for $20,000 because the leasee pays the leaseor, the bargain purchase option. And then lastly, there's a transfer here. So this last journal entry takes the balance of the original present value at inception, the 476.484, and moves it from the asset under finance lease account to a basic equipment asset account. Okay, that's all it does is it transfers that amount. In scenario B, same idea, the interest payable is debited for the 1,212 that was accrued previously. The remaining 412s debit interest expense for the leftover, so 606. Debit the lease obligation for the balance that remains, in this case 18,182. Credit the $20,000 residual for cash and then move the $500,000 present value to the asset account, which now becomes its original cost. And that is the settlement entry for the lease. So now we'll move on to our fourth requirement, which is going to be basically, again, for both scenarios, to prepare the partial balance sheet for Pebbles for the year end of December 31st, 2021. The balance sheets will look the same in terms of the accounts and everything. The only difference will be numbers. So under scenario A, with the lease or rate unknown, we will show in our non-current assets, the asset under finance lease or capital lease if it's ASPI, the present value of 476,484 less the accumulated depreciation, which is the one years or eight months. Remember this whole thing is eight over 12 because of when the lease was entered into. So the depreciation expense for that eight month period is the same as the accumulated. And so we show 31,591 for a net carrying value 444,893. In the second scenario, with the lease or rate known, the present value was 500,000, and the depreciation expense that we recorded at the end of the year was 33,333. Now we have our liabilities. We have current liabilities and non-current liabilities. We don't have current assets in this situation because it's a long-term asset. We're going to show two things in the current liabilities. One, the interest payable, where if you go back and you review the journal entries, we had accrued interest expense under the first scenario of 30,803, which was the same thing as this 46,204 down here times eight over 12, because we prorated that. So that's where 30,803 comes from. Then in the amortization table, you see we have a current portion of the lease obligation that comes due within the next year of 45,246 and a long-term portion of 339,788. And of course, the sum of the two will equal the 385,034 balance after the first payment. In scenario B, again, Go back and look at the journal entries. We accrued 27,237, so that's the interest payable. And the current portion of the lease obligation is 50,595, and the long-term portion is 357,955. And that's what the balance sheets look like under these scenarios. So let's now wrap up with some key points to remember. As always, the lease payment is determined by the leaseor and always includes a residual, the future value in that calculation, whether it's guaranteed or not, using an implicit rate that may or not be known by the leasee. In our situation here, that residual value was determined to be the BPO. If the BPO exists, then that supersedes the residual value that is otherwise stated, and that becomes the future value. Make sure that your calculator is in begin mode because lease payments typically occur at the beginning of the period. Once the uh, leaseor determines the payment, the leasee takes that payment to calculate the present value. 
A residual is included only if the residual is guaranteed. It will be included as a future value. But in our situation here, we had a BPO, and so the BPO supersedes any residual value and becomes the future value. Under IFRS, the lease rate used by the lessee is the leaseor's implicit rate because it is determinable. Under ASPE, the lower of the two rates is used, so the lower of the implicit rate, if known, or the leasee's IBR. So even if the leaseor's rate is known and the leasee's incremental borrowing rate is lower, you would go with the lower rate. Under ASPE and the classification basis approach, only one of the following is required to trigger a capital lease, a direct title transfer, a bargain purchase option, which would assume a title of transfer, where the economic life is greater than or equal to 75% calculated as the lease term over the useful life, and then the economic value has to equal or exceed 90% based on the calculation of the present value of the minimum lease payments divided by the fair value. Under IFRS and using the contract basis approach, all leases are essentially classified as financing leases unless they are deemed to be short term or of low dollar value. The amount capitalized by the lessee is the lower of the present value of the minimum lease payments or the asset fair value at the inception of the lease. And remember that the capitalized amount cannot exceed the asset fair value. Uh, when a BPO is present, the transfer of title to the leasee is to be assumed and the BPO supersedes any stated residual at the end of the lease term and therefore is expected to become that future cash flow as I indicated earlier. When that BPO or title transfer is present, the leasee depreciates the leased asset over the useful life. And finally, if there's no lease payment at year end, then the interest expense must always be accrued and prorated if necessary. So in our situation here, the lease payment was at the beginning of the next month, January 1st. And so we had to accrue the interest expense on a prorated basis at December 31st. So this concludes tutorial 13. For additional problems and information, refer to your course materials.